Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Two, Chapter One, The Trespassers. Coming presently upon the Redden Road, André Louis, obeying instinct rather than reason, turned his face to the south, and plodded wearily and mechanically forward. He had no clear idea of whither he was going, or of whither he should go. All that imported at that moment was to put as great a distance as possible between Gavriac and himself. He had a vague, half-formed notion of returning to Nantes, and there, by employing the newly found weapon of his oratory, excite the people into sheltering him as the first victim of the persecution he had foreseen, and against which he had sworn them to take up arms. But the idea was one which he entertained merely as an indefinite possibility, upon which he felt no real impulse to act. Meanwhile he chuckled at the thought of Fresnel, as he had last seen him, with his muffled face and glaring eyeballs. For one who was anything but a man of action, he writes, I felt that I had acquitted myself none so badly. It is a phrase that recurs at intervals in his sketchy confessions. Constantly is he reminding you that he is a man of mental and not physical activities, and apologizing when dire necessity drives him into acts of violence. I suspect this insistence upon his philosophic detachment, for which I confess he had justification enough to betray his besetting vanity. With increasing fatigue came depression and self-criticism. He had stupidly overshot his mark in insultingly denouncing M. de Lesdiguier. It is much better, he says somewhere, to be wicked than to be stupid. Most of this world's misery is the fruit, not, as priests tell us, of wickedness, but of stupidity. And we know that of all stupidities he considered anger the most deplorable. Yet he had permitted himself to be angry with a creature like Monsieur de Lesdiguier, a lackey, a fribble, a nothing, despite his potentialities for evil. He could perfectly have discharged his self-imposed mission without arousing the vindictive resentment of the king's lieutenant. He beheld himself vaguely launched upon life with the riding suit in which he stood, a single louis d'or and a few pieces of silver for all capital, and a knowledge of law which had been inadequate to preserve him from the consequences of infringing it. He had, in addition, but these things that were to be the real salvation of him he did not reckon, his gift of laughter, sadly repressed of late, and the philosophic outlook and mercurial temperament which are the stock in trade of your adventurer in all ages. Meanwhile he tramped mechanically on through the night, until he felt that he could tramp no more. He had skirted the little township of Guichen, and now, within a half-mile of Guinen, and with Gavriac a good seven miles behind him, his legs refused to carry him any farther. He was midway across the vast common to the north of Guinen, when he came to a halt. He had left the road and taken heedlessly to the footpath that struck across the waste of indifferent pasture interspersed with clumps of gorse. A stone's throw away on his right the common was bordered by a thorn hedge. Beyond this loomed a tall building which he knew to be an open barn, standing on the edge of a long stretch of meadowland. That dark, silent shadow it may have been that brought him to a standstill, suggesting shelter to his subconsciousness. A moment he hesitated. Then he struck across towards a spot where a gap in the hedge was closed by a five-barred gate. He pushed the gate open, went through the gap, and stood now before the barn. It was as big as a house. It consisted of no more than a roof carried upon half a dozen tall brick pillars. But densely packed under that roof was a great stack of hay, 
that promised a warm couch on so cold a night. Stout timbers had been built into the brick pillars, with projecting ends to serve as ladders by which the laborer might climb to pack or withdraw hay. With what little strength remained him, André Louis climbed by one of these, and landed safely at the top, where he was forced to kneel, for lack of room to stand upright. Arrived there, he removed his coat and neckcloth, his sodden boots and stockings. Next he cleared a trough for his body, and lying down in it, covered himself to the neck with the hay he had removed. Within five minutes he was lost to all worldly cares, and soundly asleep. When next he awakened, the sun was already high in the heavens, from which he concluded that the morning was well advanced, and this before he realized quite where he was or how he came there. Then to his awakening senses came a drone of voices close at hand, to which at first he paid little heed. He was deliciously refreshed, luxuriously drowsy, and luxuriously warm. But as consciousness and memory grew more full, he raised his head clear of the hay that he might free both ears to listen, his pulses faintly quickened by the nascent fear that those voices might bode him no good. Then he caught the reassuring accents of a woman, musical and silvery, though laden with alarm. Ah, mon Dieu, Leandre, let us separate at once, if it should be my father. And upon this a man's voice broke in, calm and reassuring. No, no, Clemen. You are mistaken. There is no one coming. We are quite safe. Why do you start at shadows? Ah, Leandre, if he should find us here together, I tremble at the very thought. More was not needed to reassure André Louis. He had overheard enough to know that this was but the case of a pair of lovers, who, with less to fear of life, were yet after the manner of their kind, more timid of heart than he. Curiosity drew him from his warm trough to the edge of the hay. Lying prone, he advanced his head, and peered down. In the space of cropped meadow between the barn and the hedge stood a man and a woman, both young. The man was a well-set-up, comely fellow, with a fine head of chestnut hair tied in a queue by a broad bow of black satin. He was dressed with certain tawdry attempts at ostentatious embellishments, which did not prepossess one at first glance in his favour. His coat, of a fashionable cut, was of faded plum-coloured velvet edged with silver lace, whose glory had long since departed. He affected ruffles, but for want of starch they hung like weeping willows over his hands that were fine and delicate. His breeches were of plain black cloth, and his black stockings were of cotton, matters entirely out of harmony with his magnificent coat. His shoes, stout and serviceable, were decked with buckles of cheap, lack-luster paste. But for his engaging and ingenious countenance, André Louis must have set him down as a knight of that order which lives dishonestly by its wits. As it was, he suspended judgment whilst pushing investigation further by a study of the girl. At the outset, be it confessed, that it was a study that attracted him prodigiously. And this, notwithstanding the fact that, bookish and studious as were his ways, and in despite of his years, it was far from his habit to waste consideration on femininity. The child, she was no more than that, perhaps twenty at the most, possessed, in addition to the allurements of face and shape that went very near perfection, a sparkling vivacity, and a grace of movement the like of which André Louis did not remember ever before to have beheld assembled in one person. And her voice, too, that musical, silvery voice that had awakened him, possessed in its 
exquisite modulations, an allurement of its own, that must have been irresistible, he thought, in the ugliest of her sex. She wore a hooded mantle of green cloth, and the hood being thrown back, her dainty head was all revealed to him. There were glints of gold struck by the morning sun from her light nut-brown hair that hung in a cluster of curls about her oval face. Her complexion was of a delicacy that he could compare only with a rose petal. He could not at that distance discern the color of her eyes, but he guessed them blue as he admired the sparkle of them under the fine, dark line of eyebrows. He could not have told you why, but he was conscious that it aggrieved him to find her so intimate with this pretty young fellow, who was partly clad, as it appeared, in the cast-offs of a nobleman. He could not guess her station, but the speech that reached him was cultured in tone and word. He strained to listen. "'I shall know no peace, Leandre, until we are safely wed,' she was saying. Not until then shall I count myself beyond his reach. And yet if we marry without his consent, we but make trouble for ourselves, and of gaining his consent I almost despair. Evidently, thought André Louis, her father was a man of sense, who saw through the shabby finery of Monsieur Leandre, and was not to be dazzled by cheap paste buckles. My dear Clemen, the young man was answering her, standing squarely before her and holding both her hands. You are wrong to despond. If I do not reveal to you all the stratagem that I have prepared to win the consent of your unnatural parent, it is because I am loath to rob you of the pleasure of the surprise that is in store. But place your faith in me, and in that ingenious friend of whom I have spoken, and who should be here at any moment." The stilted ass! Had he learnt that speech by heart in advance, or was he by nature a pedantic idiot who expressed himself in this set and formal manner? How came so sweet a blossom to waste her perfume on such a prig? And what a ridiculous name the creature owned! Thus André Louis to himself from his observatory. Meanwhile she was speaking. That is what my heart desires, Leandre but I am beset by fears lest your stratagem should be too late. I am to marry this horrible Marquis of Sabrufadeli this very day. He arrives by noon. He comes to sign the contract to make me Marchioness of Sabrufadeli. Oh! It was a cry of pain from that tender young heart. The very name burns my lips. If it were mine I could never utter it. Never! The man is so detestable. Save me, Leandre, save me. You are my only hope. André Louis was conscious of a pang of disappointment. She failed to soar to the heights he had expected of her. She was evidently infected by the stilted manner of her ridiculous lover. There was an atrocious lack of sincerity about her words. They touched his mind but left his heart unmoved. Perhaps this was because of his antipathy to M. Leandre, and to the issue involved. So, her father was marrying her to a marquis. That implied birth on her side. And yet she was content to pair off with his dull young adventurer in the tarnished lace. It was, he supposed, the sort of thing to be expected of a sex that all philosophy had taught him to regard as the maddest part of a mad species. "'It shall never be,' Monsieur Leandre was storming passionately. "'Never! I swear it!' And he shook his puny fist at the blue vault of heaven, Ajax defying Jupiter. "'Ah! But here comes our subtle friend!' André Louis did not catch the name, Monsieur Leandre having at that moment turned to face the gap in the hedge. He will bring us news, I know. André Louis looked also in the direction of the gap. Through it emerged a lean, slight man in a rusty cloak, 
and a three-cornered hat worn well down over his nose so as to shade his face. And when presently he doffed this hat and made a sweeping bow to the young lovers, André Louis confessed to himself that had he been cursed with such a hang-dog countenance, he would have worn his hat in precisely such a manner, so as to conceal as much of it as possible. If M. Leandre appeared to be wearing, in part at least, the cast-offs of a nobleman, the newcomer appeared to be wearing the cast-offs of M. Leandre. Yet, despite his vile clothes and viler face, with its three days' growth of beard, the fellow carried himself with a certain air. He positively strutted as he advanced, and he made a leg in a manner that was courtly and practised. Monsieur, said he, with the air of a conspirator, the time for action has arrived, and so has the Marquis. That is why. The young lovers sprang apart in consternation. Clemen, with clasped hands, parted lips, and a bosom that raced distractingly under its white fichu monture. M. Leandre agape, the very picture of foolishness and dismay. Meanwhile the newcomer rattled on. I was at the inn an hour ago, when he descended there, and I studied him attentively whilst he was at breakfast. Having done so, not a single doubt remains me of our success. As for what he looks like, I could entertain you at length upon the fashion in which nature has designed his gross fatuity. But that is no matter. We are concerned with what he is, and with the wit of him, and I tell you confidently that I find him so dull and stupid that you may be confident he will tumble headlong into each and all of the traps I have so cunningly prepared for him. Tell me, tell me, speak, Clemen implored him, holding out her hands in a supplication no man of sensibility could have resisted and then, on the instant, she caught her breath on a faint scream. "'My father!' she exclaimed, turning distractedly from one to the other of the two. "'He is coming! We are lost!' "'You must fly, Clemen,' said Monsieur Leandre. "'Too late!' she sobbed. "'Too late! He is here!' "'Calm, mademoiselle, calm!' the subtle friend was urging her. Keep calm and trust to me. I promise you that all shall be well. Oh, cried Monsieur Leandre limply, say what you will, my friend. This is ruin, the end of all our hopes. Your wits will never extricate us from this. Never. Through the gap strode now an enormous man with an inflamed moon face and a great nose, decently dressed after the fashion of a solid bourgeois. There was no mistaking his anger, but the expression that it found was an amazement to André Louis. Leandre, you're an imbecile! Too much phlegm! Too much phlegm! Your words wouldn't convince a ploughboy. Have you considered what they mean at all? Thus, he cried, Casting his round hat from him in a broad gesture, he took his stand at Monsieur Leandre's side, and repeated the very words that Leandre had lately uttered, what time the three observed him coolly and attentively. "'Oh, say what you will, my friend. This is ruin, the end of all our hopes. Your wits will never extricate us from this. Never!' A frenzy of despair vibrated in his accents. He swung again to face Monsieur Leandre. Thus, he bade him contemptuously, let the passion of your hopelessness express itself in your voice. Consider that you are not asking Scaramouche here whether he has put a patch in your breeches. You are a despairing lover, expressing— He checked abruptly, startled. André Louis, suddenly realizing what was afoot and how duped he had been, had loosed his laughter. The sound of it pealing and booming uncannily under the great roof that so immediately confined him was startling to those below. The fat man was the first to recover, and he announced it after his own fashion in one of the ready sarcasms in which he habitually dealt. "'Hark!' he cried. 
The very gods laugh at you, Leandre. Then he addressed the roof of the barn and its invisible tenant. Hi! You there! André Louis revealed himself by a further protrusion of his tussled head. Good morning, said he, pleasantly. Rising now on his knees, his horizon was suddenly extended to include the broad common beyond the hedge. He beheld there an enormous and very battered travelling chaise, a cart piled up with timbers, partly visible under the sheet of oiled canvas that covered them, and a sort of house on wheels equipped with a tin chimney, from which the smoke was slowly curling. Three heavy Flemish horses and a couple of donkeys, all of them hobbled, were contentedly cropping the grass in the neighbourhood of these vehicles. These, had he perceived them sooner, must have given him the clue to the queer scene that had been played under his eyes. Beyond the hedge other figures were moving. Three at that moment came crowding into the gap, a saucy-faced girl with a tip-tilted nose, whom he supposed to be Columbine, the sobrette, a lean, active youngster, who must be the lackey Harlequin, and another rather loutish youth, who might be a zany or an apothecary. All this he took in at a comprehensive glance that consumed no more time than it had taken him to say good morning. To that good morning Pantaloon replied in a bellow, "'What the devil are you doing up there?' "'Precisely the same thing that you are doing down there,' was the answer. "'I am trespassing.' Eh? said Pantaloon, and looked at his companions, some of the assurance beaten out of his big red face, although the thing was one that they did habitually, to hear it called by its proper name was disconcerting. "'Whose land is this?' he asked, with diminishing assurance. André Louis answered whilst drawing on his stockings. "'I believe it to be the property of the Marquis de la Tour d'Azire.' Well, "'That's a high-sounding name.' Is the gentleman severe? The gentleman, said André Louis, is the devil. Or rather, I should prefer to say upon reflection that the devil is a gentleman by comparison. And yet, interposed the villainous-looking fellow who played Scaramouche, by your own confessing you don't hesitate yourself to trespass upon his property. Ah, but then you see, I am a lawyer and lawyers are notoriously unable to observe the law, just as actors are notoriously unable to act. Moreover, sir, nature imposes her limits upon us, and nature conquers respect for laws, as she conquers all else. Nature conquered me last night, when I had got as far as this, and so I slept here without regard for the very high and puissant Marquis de la Tour d'Azire. At the same time, Monsieur Scaramouche, You'll observe that I did not flaunt my trespass quite as openly as you and your companions. Having donned his boots, André Louis came nimbly to the ground in his shirt-sleeves, his riding-coat over his arm. As he stood there to don it, the little cunning eyes of the heavy father conned him in detail, observing that his clothes, if plain, were of a good fashion, that his shirt was of a fine cambric, and that he expressed himself like a man of culture, such as he claimed to be, M. Pantaloon was disposed to be civil. "'I am very grateful to you for the warning, sir,' he was beginning. "'Act upon it, my friend. The garde champette of M. Désir have orders to fire on trespassers. Imitate me, and decamp.' They followed him upon the instant through the gap in the hedge to the encampment on the common. There André Louis took his leave of them, but as he was turning away he perceived a young man of the company performing his morning toilet at a bucket placed upon one of the wooden steps at the tail of the house on wheels. A moment he hesitated. Then he turned frankly to Monsieur Pantaloon, who was still at his elbow. "'If it were not unconscionable to encroach so far upon your hospitality, monsieur,' said he, I would beg leave to imitate that very excellent young gentleman before I leave you. But, my dear sir, good nature oozed out of every pore of the fat body of the master player. It is nothing at all. But, by all means, Rodemont will provide what you require, 
He is the dandy of the company in real life, though a fire-eater on the stage. Hi, Rodamont! The young ablutionist straightened his long body from the right angle in which it had been bent over the bucket, and looked out through a foam of soap suds. Pantaloon issued an order, and Rodamont, who was indeed as gentle and amiable off the stage as he was formidable and terrible upon it, made the stranger free of the bucket in the friendliest manner. So André Louis once more removed his neckcloth and his coat, and rolled up the sleeves of his fine shirt, whilst Rodamont procured him soap, a towel, and presently a broken comb and even a greasy hair-ribbon, in case the gentleman should have lost his own. This last André Louis declined, but the comb he gratefully accepted, and having presently washed himself clean, stood with the towel flung over his left shoulder, restoring order to his dishevelled locks before a broken piece of mirror affixed to the door of the travelling house. He was standing thus, what time the gentle Rodemont babbled aimlessly at his side, when his ears caught the sound of hooves. He looked over his shoulder carelessly, and then stood frozen, with uplifted comb and loosened mouth. Away across the common, on the road that bordered it, he beheld a party of seven horsemen, in the blue coats with red facings, of the Mère Chausse. Not for a moment did he doubt what was the quarry of this prowling gendarmerie. It was as if the chill shadow of the gallows had fallen suddenly upon him. And then the troop halted, abreast with them, and the sergeant, leading it, sent his bawling voice across the common. "'Hi! There! Hi!' His tone rang with menace. Every member of the company, and there were some twelve in all, stood at gaze. Pantaloon advanced a step or two, stalking, his head thrown back, his manner that of a king's lieutenant. "'Now, what the devil's this?' quoth he, but whether of fate or heaven or the sergeant was not clear. There was a brief colloquy among the horsemen. Then they came trotting across the common straight towards the player's encampment. André Louis had remained standing at the tail of the travelling house. He was still passing the comb through his straggling hair, but mechanically and unconsciously his mind was all intent upon the advancing troop, his wits alert and gathered together for a leap in whatever direction should be indicated. Still in the distance, but evidently impatient, the sergeant bawled a question. "'Who gave you leave to encamp here?' It was a question that reassured André Louis not at all. He was not deceived by it into supposing or even hoping that the business of these men was merely to round up vagrants and trespassers. That was no part of their real duty. It was something done in passing, done perhaps in the hope of levying attacks of their own. It was very long odds that they were from Rennes, and that their real business was the hunting down of a young lawyer charged with sedition. Meanwhile, Pantaloon was shouting back, "'Who gave us leave, do you say? What leave? This is communal land, free to all!' The sergeant laughed unpleasantly, and came on, his troop following. "'There is,' said a voice at Pantaloon's elbow, no such thing as communal land in the proper sense in all Monsieur de la Tour d'Azier's vast domain. This is terre sensive, and his bailiffs collect his dues from all who send their beasts to graze here. Pantaloon turned to behold at his side André Louis, in his shirt-sleeves, and without a neckcloth, the towel still trailing over his left shoulder, a comb in his hand, his hair half-dressed. "'God of God!' swore Pantaloon. "'But it is an ogre, this Marquis de la Tour d'Azier. "'I have told you already what I think of him,' said André Louis. "'As for these fellows, you had better let me deal with them. "'I have experience of their kind.' "'And without waiting for Pantaloon's consent, "'André Louis stepped forward to meet the advancing men of the Mère Chausse. "'He had realized that here boldness alone could save him. When, a moment later, the sergeant pulled up his horse alongside of this half-dressed young man, André Louis combed his hair, 
what time he looked up with a half-smile intended to be friendly, ingenious, and disarming. In spite of it, the sergeant hailed him gruffly. "'Are you the leader of this troop of vagabonds?' "'Yes. That is to say, my father there is really the leader.' and he jerked a thumb in the direction of M. Pantaloon, who stood at gaze out of earshot in the background. "'What is your pleasure, Captain?' "'My pleasure is to tell you that you are very likely to be jailed for this, all the pack of you.' His voice was loud and bullying. It carried across the common to the ears of every member of the company, and brought them all to stricken attention where they stood. The lot of strolling players was hard enough— without the addition of jailings. "'But how so, my captain? This is communal land, free to all.' "'It is nothing of the kind.' "'Where are the fences?' quoth André Louis, waving the hand that held the comb as if to indicate the openness of the place. "'Fences!' snorted the sergeant. "'What have fences to do with the matter? This is terre sensive. There is no grazing here, save by payment of dues to the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir. "'But we are not grazing,' quoth the innocent André Louis. "'To the devil with you, Zany! You are not grazing, but your beasts are grazing!' "'They eat so little,' André Louis apologized, and again essayed his ingratiating smile. The sergeant grew more terrible than ever. "'That is not the point.' The point is that you are committing what amounts to a theft, and there's the jail for thieves. Technically, I suppose you are right, sighed André Louis, and fell to combing his hair again, still looking up into the sergeant's face. But we have sinned in ignorance. We are grateful to you for the warning. He passed the comb into his left hand, and with his right fumbled in his breeches pocket, whence there came a faint jingle of coins. We are desolated to have brought you out of your way. Perhaps, for their trouble, your men would honour us by stopping at the next inn to drink the health of of this Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, or any other health that they think proper. Some of the clouds lifted from the sergeant's brow, but not yet all. Well, well, said he gruffly, "'But you must decamp. You understand.' He leaned from the saddle to bring his recipient hand to a convenient distance. André Louis placed in it a three-livre piece. "'In half an hour,' said André Louis. "'Why in half an hour? Why not at once?' "'Oh, but time to break our fast.' They looked at each other. The sergeant next considered the broad piece of silver in his palm— then at last his features relaxed from their sternness. "'After all,' said he, "'it is none of our business to play the tip-staves for Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. "'We are of the Marchosé from Rennes.' "'André Louis's eyelids played him false by flickering. "'But if you linger, look out for the garde champêtre of the Marquis. "'You'll find them not at all accommodating.' "'Well,' "'Well, a good appetite to you, monsieur,' said he in valediction. "'A pleasant ride, my captain,' answered André Louis. The sergeant wheeled his horse about, his troop wheeled with him. They were starting off when he reined up again. "'You, monsieur,' he called over his shoulder. In a bound, André Louis was beside his stirrup. We are in quest of a scoundrel named André Louis Moreau, from Gavriac, a fugitive from justice wanted for the gallows on a matter of sedition. You've seen nothing, I suppose, of a man whose movements seemed to you suspicious. Indeed we have, said André Louis very boldly, his face eager with consciousness of the ability to oblige. You have? cried the sergeant, in a ringing voice. Where? When? "'Yesterday evening in the neighbourhood of Guinenne.' "'Yes, yes?' "'The sergeant felt himself hot upon the trail. "'There was a fellow who seemed very fearful of being recognised, "'a man of fifty or thereabouts. 
Fifty! cried the sergeant, and his face fell. Bah! This man of ours is no older than yourself. A thin wisp of a fellow of about your own height, and of black hair, just like your own, by the description. Keep a lookout on your travels, master player. The king's lieutenant in Rennes has sent us word this morning that he will pay ten louis to any one giving information that will lead to this scoundrel's arrest. So there's ten louis to be earned by keeping your eyes open, and sending word to the nearest justices. It would be a fine windfall for you, that. A fine windfall indeed, Captain, answered André Louis, laughing. But the sergeant had touched his horse with the spur, and was already trotting off in the wake of his men. André Louis continued to laugh, quite silently, as he sometimes did when the humour of a jest was peculiarly keen. Then he turned slowly about, and came back towards Pantaloon, and the rest of the company, who were now all grouped together at gaze. Pantaloon advanced to meet him with both hands outheld. For a moment André Louis thought he was about to be embraced. "'We hail you our saviour, the big man declaimed. Already the shadow of the jail was creeping over us, chilling us to the very marrow. For though we be poor, yet are we all honest folk.' and not one of us has ever suffered the indignity of prison, nor is there one of us who would survive it. But for you, my friend, it might have happened. What magic did you work? The magic that is to be worked in France with a king's portrait. The French are a very loyal nation. As you will have observed, they love their king and his portrait even better than himself, especially when it is wrought in gold. But even in silver it is respected. The sergeant was so overcome by the sight of that noble visage, on a three livre piece, that his anger vanished, and he has gone his ways, leaving us to depart in peace. Ah, true. He said we must decamp. About it, my lads. Come, come. But not until after breakfast, said André Louis. A half hour for breakfast was conceded us by that loyal fellow, so deeply was he touched. True. He spoke of possible garde champêtre, but he knows as well as I do that they are not seriously to be feared, and that if they came, again the king's portrait, wrought in copper this time, would produce the same melting effect upon them. So, my dear Monsieur Pantaloon, break your fast at your ease. I can smell your cooking from here, and from the smell I argue that there is no need to wish you a good appetite. My friend, my saviour! Pantaloon flung a great arm about the young man's shoulders. "'You shall stay to breakfast with us.' "'I confess to a hope that you would ask me,' said André Louis. End of chapter 1 Book 2 of Scaramouche Scaramouche A Romance of the French Revolution By Raphael Sabatini Book 2, Chapter 2 THE SERVICE OF THESPIS They were, thought André Louis, as he sat down to breakfast with them behind the itinerant house, in the bright sunshine that tempered the cold breath of that November morning, an odd, and yet an attractive crew. An air of gaiety pervaded them. They affected to have no cares and made merry over the trials and tribulations of their nomadic life. They were curiously, yet amiably, artificial, histrionic in their manner of discharging the most commonplace of functions, exaggerated in their gestures, stilted and affected in their speech. They seemed, indeed, to belong to a world apart, a world of unreality which became real only on the planks of their stage, in the glare of their footlights, good fellowship bound them one to another, and André Louis reflected cynically that this harmony among them might be the cause of their apparent unreality. In the real world, greedy striving and the emulation of acquisitiveness preclude such amity as was present here. They numbered exactly eleven. Three women and eight men and they addressed each other by their stage names, names which denoted their several types, and never, or only very slightly, 
varied, no matter what might be the play that they performed. "'We are,' Pantaloon informed him, "'one of those few remaining staunch bands of real players who uphold the traditions of the old Italian Commedia dell'arte. Not for us to vex our memories and stultify our wit with the stilted phrases that are the fruits of wretched author's lucubrations. Each of us is in detail his own author in a measure as he develops the part assigned to him. We are improvisers, improvisers of the old and noble Italian school. I had guessed as much, said André Louis, when I discovered you rehearsing your improvisations. Pantaloon frowned. I have observed, young sir, that your humor inclines to the pungent, not to say the acrid. It is very well. It is, I suppose, the humor that should go with such a countenance. But it may lead you astray, as in this instance. That rehearsal, a most unusual thing with us, was necessitated by the histrionic rawness of our Leandre. We are seeking to inculcate into him by training an art with which nature neglected to endow him against his present needs. Should he continue to fail in doing justice to our schooling, but we will not disturb our present harmony with the unpleasant anticipation of misfortunes which we still hope to avert. We love our Leandre for all his faults. Let me make you acquainted with our company. And he proceeded to introduce in detail. He pointed out the long and amiable Rodomont, whom André Louis already knew. His length of limb and hooked nose were his superficial qualifications to play roaring captains, Pantaloon explained. His lungs have justified our choice. You should hear him roar. At first we called him Spavento, or Epuvapte. But that was unworthy of so great an artist. Not since the superb Mondor amazed the world has so thrasonical a bully been seen upon the stage. So we conferred upon him the name of Rodomont, that Mondor made famous, and I give you my word as an actor and a gentleman, for I am a gentleman, monsieur, that he has justified us. His little eyes beamed in his great swollen face as he turned their gaze upon the object of his encomium, the terrible Rodomont, confused by so much praise, blushed like a schoolgirl as he met the solemn scrutiny of André Louis. Then here we have Scaramouche, whom also you already know. Sometimes he is Scapin, and sometimes Coviello. But in the main, Scaramouche. To which, let me tell you, he is best suited. Sometimes too well suited, I think. For he is Scaramouche not only on the stage, but also in the world. He has a gift of sly intrigue, an art of setting folk by the ears, combined with an impudent aggressiveness upon occasion when he considers himself safe from reprisals. He is... Scaramouche, the little skirmisher, to the very life. I could say more, but I am by disposition charitable and loving to all mankind. As the priest said when he kissed the serving wench, snarled Scaramouche, and went on eating. His humor, like your own, you will observe, is acrid, said Pantaloon. He passed on. Then that rascal with the lumpy nose and the grinning bucolic countenance is, of course, Perrault. Could he be aught else? I could play lovers a deal better, said the rustic cherub. That is the delusion proper to Perrault, said Pantaloon contemptuously. This heavy, beetle-browed ruffian, 
who has grown old in sin, and whose appetite increases with his years, is Polichinelle. Each one, as you perceive, is designed by nature for the part he plays. This nimble, freckled jackanapes is Harlequin, not your spangled Harlequin into which modern degeneracy has debased that first-born of Momus, but the genuine original zany of the Comedia, ragged and patched, an impudent, cowardly, black, guardly clown. "'Each one of us, as you perceive,' said Harlequin, mimicking the leader of the troop, "'is designed by nature for the part he plays.' "'Physically, my friend, physically only, "'else we should not have so much trouble "'in teaching this beautiful Leandre to become a lover. "'Then we have Pasquariel here, "'who is sometimes an apothecary, "'sometimes a notary, sometimes a lackey. "'An amiable, accommodating fellow. "'He is also an excellent cook, "'being a child of Italy, "'that land of gluttons. "'And finally—' You have myself, who, as the father of the company, very properly play as pantaloon, the roles of father. Sometimes, it is true, I am a deluded husband, and sometimes an ignorant, self-sufficient doctor. But it is rarely that I find it necessary to call myself other than pantaloon. For the rest— I am the only one who has a name, a real name. It is Benet, monsieur. And now, for the ladies. First, in order of seniority, we have Madame there. He waved one of his great hands towards a buxom, smiling blonde of five and forty, who is seated on the lowest of the steps of the travelling house. She is our duenne or mother, or nurse, as the case requires. She is known quite simply and royally as Madame. If she ever had a name in the world, she has long since forgotten it, which is perhaps as well. Then we have this pert jade with the tip-tilted nose and the wide mouth, who is, of course, our sobrette, Columbine. And lastly, my daughter, Clemence. An amoureuse of talents not to be matched outside the Comédie Française, of which she has the bad taste to aspire to become a member. The lovely Clemen, and lovely indeed she was, tossed her nut-brown curls and laughed as she looked across at André Louis. Her eyes, he had perceived by now, were not blue, but hazel. Do not believe him, monsieur. Here I am queen and I prefer to be queen here, rather than a slave in Paris. Mademoiselle, said André Louis quite solemnly, will be queen wherever she condescends to reign. Her only answer was a timid and yet alluring glance from under fluttering lids. Meanwhile her father was bawling at the comely young man who played lovers. You hear, Leandre? That is the sort of speech you should practice. Leandre raised languid eyebrows. That, quoth he, and shrugged. The merest commonplace. André Louis laughed approval. Monsieur Leandre is of a readier wit than you concede. There is a subtlety in pronouncing it a commonplace to call Mademoiselle Clemen a queen. Some laughed, M. Binet amongst them, with good-humoured mockery. "'You think he has the wit to mean it thus? Bah! His subtleties are all unconscious.' The conversation becoming general, André Louis soon learnt what yet there was to learn of this strolling band. They were on their way to Guichen, where they hoped to prosper at the fair that was to open on Monday next. They would make their triumphal entry into the town at noon, and setting up their stage in the old market, they would give their first performance that same Saturday night, in a new canevas, or scenario, of M. Benet's own, which should set the rustics gaping. And then M. Benet fetched a sigh, 
and addressed himself to the elderly, swarthy, beetle-browed Polichinel, who sat on his left. "'But we shall miss Felicien,' said he. "'Indeed, I do not know what we shall do without him.' "'Oh, we shall contrive,' said Polichinel, with his mouth full. "'So you always say, whatever happens, knowing that in any case the contriving will not fall upon yourself.' "'He should not be difficult to replace,' said Harlequin. "'True, if we were in a civilized land. But where among the rustics of Brittany are we to find a fellow of even his poor parts?' Monsieur Binet turned to André Louis. "'He was our property man, our machinist, our stage carpenter, our man of affairs, and occasionally he acted.' "'The part of Figaro, I presume,' said André Louis, which elicited a laugh. "'So you are acquainted with Beaumarchais,' Benet eyed the young man with fresh interest. "'He is tolerably well known, I think?' "'In Paris, to be sure, but I had not dreamt his fame had reached the wilds of Brittany.' "'But then I was some years in Paris.' at the Lycée of Louis Le Grand. It was there I made acquaintance with his work. "'A dangerous man,' said Polichinelle sententiously. "'Indeed you are right,' Pantaloon agreed. "'Clever! I do not deny him that, although myself I find little use for authors, but of a sinister cleverness responsible for the dissemination of many of these subversive new ideas. I think such writers should be suppressed. Monsieur de la Tour d'Azur would probably agree with you. The gentleman who, by the simple exertion of his will, turns this communal land into his own property. And André Louis drained his cup, which had been filled with the poor vin gris that was the player's drink. It was a remark that might have precipitated an argument had it not also reminded M. Binet of the terms on which they were encamped there, and of the fact that the half-hour was more than past. In a moment he was on his feet, leaping up with an agility surprising in so corpulent a man, issuing his commands like a marshal on a field of battle. "'Come! Come, my lads! Are we to sit guzzling here all day?' Time flees, and there's a deal to be done if we are to make our entry into Guichen at noon. Go, get you dressed. We strike camp in twenty minutes. Be stir, ladies, to your chaise. See that you contrive to look your best. Soon the eyes of Guichen will be upon you, and the condition of your interior tomorrow will depend upon the impression made by your exterior today. Away! Away! The implicit obedience this autocrat commanded set them in a whirl. Baskets and boxes were dragged forth to receive the platters and remains of their meagre feast. In an instant the ground was cleared, and the three ladies had taken their departure to the chaise, which was set apart for their use. The men were already climbing into the house on wheels, when Benet turned to André Louis. "'We part here, sir.' said he dramatically. The richer by your acquaintance, your debtors, and your friends. He put forth his podgy hand. Slowly, André Louis took it into his own. He had been thinking swiftly in the last few moments, and remembering the safety he had found from his pursuers in the bosom of this company. It occurred to him that nowhere could he be better hidden for the present until the quest for him should have died down. "'Sir,' he said, "'the indebtedness is on my side. It is not every day one has the felicity to sit down with so illustrious and engaging a company.' Benet's little eyes peered suspiciously at the young man in quest of irony. He found nothing but candor and simple good faith. "'I part from you reluctantly,' André Louis continued." the more reluctantly, since I do not perceive the absolute necessity for parting. "'How 
now, quoth Benet, frowning and slowly withdrawing the hand which the other had already retained rather longer than was necessary. Thus, André Louis explained himself, you may set me down as a sort of knight of rueful countenance in quest of adventure, with no fixed purpose in life at present. You will not marvel that what I have seen of yourself and your distinguished troop should inspire me to desire your better acquaintance. On your side, you tell me that you are in need of someone to replace your Figaro, your Felicien, I think you called him. Whilst it may be presumptuous of me to hope that I could discharge an office so varied and so onerous. You are indulging that acrid humour of yours again, my friend, Benet interrupted him. Excepting for that, he added slowly, meditatively, his little eyes screwed up, we might discuss this proposal that you seem to be making. Alas, we can accept nothing. If you take me, you take me as I am. What else is possible? As for this humour, such as it is, which you decry, you might turn it to profitable account. How so? In several ways. I might, for instance, teach Leandre to make love. Pantaloon burst into laughter. You do not lack confidence in your powers. Modesty does not afflict you. Therefore I evince the first quality necessary in an actor. Can you act? Upon occasion, I think, said André Louis, his thoughts upon his performance at Rennes and Nantes, and wondering when in all his histrionic career Pantaloon's improvisations had so rent the heart of mobs. M. Benet was musing. "'Do you know much of the theatre? quoth he. "'Everything,' said André Louis. Mm, "'I said that modesty will prove no obstacle in your career. "'But consider. "'I know the work of Beaumarchais, Eglatine, Mercier, Chanier, and many others of our contemporaries. Then I have read, of course, Moliere, Racine, Corniel, besides many other lesser French writers. Of foreign authors I am intimate with the works of Gozzi, Goldoni, Guarini, Bibbiena, Machiavelli, Secchi, Tasso, Ariosto, and Fadini. Whilst of those of antiquity I know most of the work of a Euripides and Aristophanes, Terence, Plautus. Enough! roared Pantaloon. I am not nearly through with my list, said André Louis. You may keep the rest for another day. In heaven's name, what can have induced you to read so many dramatic authors? In my humble way, I am a student of man. And some years ago I made the discovery that he is most intimately to be studied in the reflections of him provided for the theatre. That is a very original and profound discovery, said Pantaloon, quite seriously. It had never occurred to me. Yet is it true? Sir, it is a truth that dignifies our art. You are a man of parts, that is clear to me. It has been clear since first I met you. I can read a man. I knew you from the moment that you said, Good morning. Tell me now, do you think you could assist me upon occasion in the preparation of a scenario? My mind, fully engaged as it is with a thousand details of organization, is not always as clear as I would have it for such work. Could you... Assist me there, do you think? I am quite sure I could. Hmm. Yes. I was sure you would be. The other duties that were Felicien's you would soon learn. Well, well. If you are willing, you may come along with us. You'd want some salary, I suppose. If it is usual, said André Louis. What should you say to ten livres a month? I should say that it isn't exactly the riches of Peru. I might go as far as fifteen, 
said Binet, reluctantly. But times are bad. I'll make them better for you. I've no doubt you believe it. Then we understand each other? Perfectly, said André Louis, dryly, and was thus committed to the service of Thespis. End of chapter 2 of Book 2 Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini Book 2, Chapter 3 The Comic Muse The company's entrance into the township of Guichen, if not exactly triumphal, as Binet had expressed the desire that it should be, was at least sufficiently startling and cacophonous to set the rustics gaping. To them these fantastic creatures appeared, as indeed they were, beings from another world. First went the great travelling chaise, creaking and groaning on its way, drawn by two of the Flemish horses. It was Pantaloon who drove it, an obese and massive Pantaloon, in a tight-fitting suit of scarlet under a long brown bedgown his countenance adorned by a colossal cardboard nose. Beside him on the box sat Perrault, in a white smock, with sleeves that completely covered his hands, loose white trousers and a black skull-cap. He had whitened his face with flour, and he made hideous noises with a trumpet. On the roof of the coach were assembled Polichinelle, Scaramouche, Harlequin, and Pascariel, Polichinelle in black and white, his doublet cut in the fashion of a century ago, with humps before and behind, a white frill round his neck, and a black mask upon the upper half of his face, stood in the middle, his feet planted wide to steady him, solemnly and viciously banging a big drum. The other three were seated, each at one of the corners of the roof, their legs dangling over. Scaramouche, all in black in the Spanish fashion of the seventeenth century, his face adorned with a pair of mustachios, jangled a guitar discordantly. Harlequin, ragged and patched in every color of the rainbow, with his leather girdle and sword of lathe, the upper half of his face smeared in soot, clashed a pair of cymbals intermittently. Pascaril, as an apothecary in skull-cap and white apron, excited the hilarity of the onlookers by his enormous tin clyster, which emitted, when pumped, a dolorous squeak. Within the chaise itself, but showing themselves freely at the windows, and exchanging quips with the townsfolks, sat the three ladies of the company, Clemene, the Amoureuse, beautifully gowned in flowered satin, her own clustering ringlets concealed under a pumpkin-shaped wig, looked so much the lady of fashion that you might have wondered what she was doing in that fantastic rabble. Madame, as the mother, was also dressed with splendor, but exaggerated to achieve the ridiculous. Her headdress was a monstrous structure adorned with flowers and superimposed by little ostrich plumes. Columbine sat facing them, her back to the horses, falsely demure, in milkmaid bonnet of white muslin and a striped gown of green and blue. The marvel was that the old chaise, which in its halcyon days may have served to carry some dignitary of the church, did not founder instead of merely groaning under that excessive and ribald load. Next came the house on wheels, led by the long, lean Rodomont, who had daubed his face red, and increased the terror of it by a pair of formidable mustachios. He was in long thigh boots and leather jerkin, trailing an enormous sword, from a crimson baldric. He wore a broad felt hat with a draggled feather, and as he advanced 
he raised his great voice and roared out defiance and threats of blood-curdling butchery to be performed upon all and sundry on the roof of this vehicle sat leandre alone he was in blue satin with ruffles small sword powdered hair patches and spyglass and red-heeled shoes the complete courtier looking very handsome the women of guichen ogled him coquettishly he took the ogling as a proper tribute to his personal endowments and returned it with interest like climen he looked out of place amid the bandits who composed the remainder of the company bringing up the rear came andre louis leading the two donkeys that dragged the property cart he had insisted upon assuming a false nose representing as for embellishment that which he intended for disguise for the rest he had retained his own garments no one paid any attention to him as he trudged along beside his donkeys an insignificant rear-guard which he was well content to be they made the tour of the town in which the activity was already above the normal in preparation for next week's fair at intervals they halted the cacophony would cease abruptly and polichinelle would announce in a stentorian voice that at five o'clock that evening in the old market monsieur benet's famous company of improvisers would perform a new comedy in four acts entitled the heartless father thus at last they came to the old market which was the ground floor of the town hall and open to the four winds by two archways on each side of its length and one archway on each side of its breadth these archways with two exceptions had been boarded up through those two which gave admission to what presently would be the theatre the ragamuffins of the town and the niggards who were reluctant to spend the necessary sou to obtain proper admission might catch furtive glimpses of the performance that afternoon was the most strenuous of andre louis's life unaccustomed as he was to any sort of manual labor it was spent in erecting and preparing the stage at one end of the market hall and he began to realize how hard earned were to be his monthly fifteen livres at first there were four of them to the task or really three for pantaloon did no more than bawl directions stripped of their finery rodomont and leandre assisted andre louis in that carpentering meanwhile the other four were at dinner with the ladies when a half hour or so later they came to carry on the work andre louis and his companions went to dine in their turn leaving polichinelle to direct the operations as well as assist in them they crossed the square to the cheap little inn where they had taken up their quarters in the narrow passage andre louis came face to face with climene her fine feathers cast and restored by now to her normal appearance and how do you like it she asked him pertly he looked her in the eyes it has its compensations quoth he in that curious cold tone of his that left one wondering whether he meant or not what he seemed to mean she knit her brows you you feel the need of compensations already faith i felt it from the beginning said he it was the perception of them allured me they were quite alone the others having gone on into the room set apart for them where food was spread andre louis who was as unlearned in woman as he was learned in man was not to know upon feeling himself suddenly extraordinarily aware of her femininity that it was she who in some subtle imperceptible manner so rendered him what she asked him with demurest innocence are these compensations he caught himself upon the brink of the abyss fifteen livres a month he said abruptly a moment she stared at him bewildered he was very disconcerting 
Then she recovered. Oh, and bed and board, said she. Don't be leaving that from the reckoning, as you seem to be doing, for your dinner will be going cold. Aren't you coming? Haven't you dined? he cried, and she wondered, had she caught a note of eagerness? No, she answered over her shoulder. I waited. What for? quoth his innocence, hopefully. I had to change, of course, zany, she answered rudely. Having dragged him as she imagined to the chopping block, she could not refrain from chopping. But then he was of those who must be chopping back. And you left your manners upstairs with your grand lady clothes, mademoiselle, I understand. A scarlet flame suffused her face. You are very insolent, she said, lamely. I've often been told so, but I don't believe it. He thrust open the door for her, and bowing with an air which imposed upon her, although it was merely copied from Fleury of the Comédie Française, so often visited in the Louis Le Grand days, he waved her in. After you, mademoiselle. For greater emphasis he deliberately broke the word into its two component parts. I thank you, monsieur, she answered frostily, as near sneering as was possible to so charming a person, and went in, nor addressed him again throughout the meal. Instead, she devoted herself with an unusual and devastating assiduity to the suspiring Leandre, that poor devil who could not successfully play the lover with her on the stage because of his longing to play it in reality. André Louis ate his herrings and black bread with a good appetite, nevertheless. It was poor fare, but then poor fare was the common lot of poor people in that winter of starvation, and since he had cast in his fortunes with a company whose affairs were not flourishing, he must accept the evils of the situation philosophically. "'Have you a name?' Benet asked him once in the course of that repast, and during a pause in the conversation. "'It happens that I have,' said he. "'I think it is Parvissimus.' "'Parvissimus?' quoth Benet. "'Is that a family name?' "'In such a company, where only the leader enjoys the privilege of a family name, the like would be unbecoming its least member. So I take the name that best becomes in me, and I think it is Parvissimus.' the very least. Benet was amused. It was droll. It showed a ready fancy. Oh, to be sure, they must get to work together on those scenarios. I shall prefer it to the carpentering, said André Louis. Nevertheless, he had to go back to it that afternoon, and to labor strenuously until four o'clock, when at last the autocratic Benet announced himself satisfied with the preparations, and proceeded again with the help of André Louis, to prepare the lights, which were supplied partly by tallow candles and partly by lamps burning fish oil. At five o'clock that evening the three knocks were sounded, and the curtain rose on the heartless father. Among the duties inherited by André Louis from the departed Felicienne, whom he replaced, was that of doorkeeper. This duty he discharged, dressed in a polichinelle costume, and wearing a pasteboard nose. It was an arrangement mutually agreeable to Monsieur Benet and himself. Monsieur Benet, who had taken the further precaution of retaining André Louis's own garments, was thereby protected against the risk of his latest recruit absconding with the takings. André Louis, without illusions on the score of Pantaloon's real object, agreed to it willingly enough, since it protected him from the chance of recognition by any acquaintance who might possibly be in Guichen. The performance was, in every sense, unexciting, the audience meagre and unenthusiastic. The benches provided in the front half of the market contained some twenty-seven persons, eleven at twenty sous ahead and sixteen at twelve, Behind these stood a rabble of some thirty others at six sous apiece. Thus the gross takings were two louis, 
ten livres, and two sous. By the time M. Binet had paid for the use of the market his lights and the expenses of his company at the inn over Sunday, there was not likely to be very much left towards the wages of his players. It is not surprising, therefore, that M. Binet's bonhomie should have been a trifle overcast that evening. "'And what do you think of it?' he asked André Louis, as they were walking back to the inn after the performance. "'Possibly it could have been worse. Probably it could not,' said he. In sheer amazement, M. Binet checked in his stride and turned to look at his companion. Huh? said he. "'Dieu de Dieu! But you are frank!' An unpopular form of service among fools, I know. "'Well, I am not a fool,' said Binet. "'That is why I am frank. I pay you the compliment of assuming intelligence in you, Monsieur Binet.' "'Oh, you do,' quoth Monsieur Binet. "'And who the devil are you to assume anything? Your assumptions are presumptuous, sir!' And with that he lapsed into silence and the gloomy business of mentally casting up his accounts. But at table over supper a half-hour later he revived the topic. "'Our latest recruit, this excellent Monsieur Parvissimus,' he announced, "'has the impudence to tell me that possibly our comedy could have been worse, but that probably it could not.' and he blew out his great round cheeks to invite a laugh at the expense of that foolish critic. "'That's bad,' said the swarthy and sardonic Polichinelle. He was grave as Radamanthus pronouncing judgment. "'That's bad. But what is infinitely worse is that the audience had the impudence to be of the same mind.' "'An ignorant pack of clods,' sneered Leandre, with a toss of his handsome head. "'You are wrong,' quoth Harlequin. "'You were born for love, my dear, not criticism.' Leandre, a dull dog, you will have conceived, looked contemptuously down upon the little man. "'And you, what were you born for?' he wondered. "'Nobody knows,' was the candid admission. "'Nor yet why. It is the case of many of us, my dear.' believe me. But why? Monsieur Binet took him up and thus spoilt the beginnings of a very pretty quarrel. Why do you say that Leandre is wrong? To be general, because he is always wrong. To be particular, because I judge the audience of Guichen to be too sophisticated for the heartless father. You would put it more happily, interposed André Louis, who was the cause of this discussion. If you said that the heartless father is too unsophisticated for the audience of Guichen. Why, what's the difference? asked Leandre. I didn't imply a difference. I merely suggested that it is a happier way to express the fact. The gentleman is being subtle, sneered Binet. Why happier? Harlequin demanded because it is easier to bring the heartless father to the sophistication of the Guichen audience than the Guichen audience to the unsophistication of the heartless father. "'Let me think that out,' groaned Polichinelle, and he took his head in his hands. But from the tail of the table André Louis was challenged by Clemene, who sat there between Columbine and Madame. "'You would alter the comedy, would you, Monsieur Parvissimus?' she cried. He turned to parry her malice. I would suggest that it be altered, he corrected, inclining his head. And how would you alter it, monsieur? I? Oh, for the better. But of course. She was sleekest sarcasm. And how would you do it? I tell us that, roared Monsieur Benet, and added, Silence! I pray you, gentlemen and ladies, silence for Monsieur Parvissimus. André Louis looked from father to daughter and smiled. Pardi, said he, 
I am between bludgeon and dagger. If I escape with my life, I shall be fortunate. Why, then, since you pin me to the very wall, I'll tell you what I should do. I should go back to the original and help myself more freely from it. The original? questioned Monsieur Binet, the author. It is called, I believe, Monsieur de Porsonniac, and was written by Moliere. Somebody tittered, but that somebody was not Monsieur Binet. He had been touched on the raw, and the look in his little eyes betrayed the fact that his bonhomme exterior covered anything but a bonhomme. "'You charge me with plagiarism,' he said at last, "'with filching the ideas of Moliere.' "'There is always, of course,' said André-Louis, unruffled, "'the alternative possibility of two great minds working upon parallel lines.' Monsieur Bonnet studied the young man attentively for a moment. He found him bland and inscrutable, and decided to pin him down. "'Then you do not imply that I have been stealing from Moliere?' "'I advise you to do so, monsieur,' was the disconcerting reply. Monsieur Benet was shocked. "'You advise me to do so? You advise me, me, Antoine Benet, to turn thief at my age?' "'He is outrageous,' said the mademoiselle indignantly. "'Outrageous is the word. I thank you for it, my dear. I take you on trust, sir. You sit at my table. You have the honour to be included in my company. And to my face you have the audacity to advise me to become a thief, the worst kind of thief that is conceivable, a thief of spiritual things, a thief of ideas. It is insufferable, intolerable. I have been, I fear, deeply mistaken in you, monsieur, just as you appear to have been mistaken in me. I am not the scoundrel you suppose me, sir, and I will not number in my company a man who dares to suggest that I should become one. Outrageous! He was very angry. His voice boomed through the little room, and the company sat hushed and something scared, their eyes upon André Louis, who was the only one entirely unmoved by this outburst of virtuous indignation. "'You realize, monsieur,' he said very quietly, "'that you are insulting the memory of the illustrious dead.' Eh? Huh? said Binet. André Louis developed his sophistries. "'You insult the memory of Molière, the greatest ornament of our stage, one of the greatest ornaments of our nation, when you suggest that there is vileness in doing that which he never hesitated to do, which no great author yet has hesitated to do. You cannot suppose that Molière ever troubled himself to be original in the matter of ideas. You cannot suppose that the stories he tells in his plays have never been told before. They were culled, as you very well know, though you seem momentarily to have forgotten it, and it is therefore necessary that I should remind you. They were culled, many of them, from the Italian authors, who themselves had culled them heavens alone knows where. Moliere took those old stories, and retold them in his own language. That is precisely what I am suggesting that you should do. Your company is a company of improvisers. You supply the dialogue as you proceed, which is rather more than Moliere ever attempted. You may, if you prefer it, though it would seem to me to be yielding to an excess of scruple, go straight to Boccaccio or Sacchetti. But even then you cannot be sure that you have reached the sources. André-Louis came off with flying colors after that, you see what a debater was lost in him, how nimble he was in the art of making white look black. The company was impressed, and no one more than Monsieur Benet, 
who found himself supplied with a crushing argument against those who in future might tax him with the impudent plagiarisms which he undoubtedly perpetrated. He retired in the best order he could from the position he had taken up at the outset. "'So that you think,' he said, at the end of a long outburst of agreement, "'you think that our story of the heartless father could be enriched by dipping into Monsieur de Porcignac, to which I confess upon reflection that it may present certain superficial resemblances. I do, most certainly I do, always provided that you do so judiciously. Times have changed since Moliere. It was as a consequence of this that Binet retired soon after, taking André Louis with him. The pair sat together late that night, and were again in close communion throughout the whole of Sunday morning. After dinner M. Binet read to the assembled company the amended and amplified canevas of The Heartless Father, which, acting upon the advice of M. Parvissimus, he had been at great pains to prepare. The company had few doubts as to the real authorship before he began to read, none at all when he had read. There was a verve, a grip about this story, and what was more, those of them who knew their Moliere realized that, far from approaching the original more closely, this canevas had drawn farther away from it. Moliere's original part, the title role, had dwindled into insignificance to the great disgust of Polichinelle, to whom it fell, but the other parts had all been built up into importance, with the exception of Leandre, who remained as before. The two great roles were now Scaramouche, in the character of the intriguing Sebrigandini, and Pantaloon, the father. There was, too, a comical part for Rodomont, as the roaring bully hired by Polichinelle to cut Leandre into ribbons and in view of the importance now of Scaramouche, the play had been rechristened Figaro Scaramouche. This last had not been without a deal of opposition from M. Benet, but his relentless collaborator, who was in reality the real author, drawing shamelessly but practically at last upon his great store of reading, had overborne him. "'You must move with the times, monsieur,' In Paris, Beaumarchais is the rage. Figaro is known today throughout the world. Let us borrow a little of his glory. It will draw the people in. They will come to see half a Figaro when they will not come to see a dozen heartless fathers. Therefore, let us cast the mantle of Figaro upon someone and proclaim it in our title. But as I am the head of the company— began M. Benet weakly. "'If you will be blind to your interests, you will presently be a head without a body. And what use is that? Can the shoulders of Pantaloon carry the mantle of Figaro?' "'You laugh. Of course you laugh. The notion is absurd. The proper person for the mantle of Figaro is Scaramouche, who is naturally Figaro's twin brother.' Thus tyrannized, the tyrant Binet gave way, comforted by the reflection that if he understood anything at all about the theatre, he had for fifteen livres a month acquired something that would presently be earning him as many louis. The company's reception of the canevas now confirmed him. If we accept Polichinelle, who, annoyed at having lost half his part in the alterations, declared the new scenario fatuous, "'Ah, you call my work fatuous, do you?' M. Benet hectored him. "'Your work,' said Polichinelle, to add his tongue in his cheek. "'Ah, pardon. I had not realized that you were the author.' "'Then realize it now.' "'You were very close with M. Parvissimus over this authorship.' said Polichinelle, with impudent suggestiveness. "'And what if I was? What do you imply?' "'That you took him to cut quills for you, of course.' "'I'll cut your ears for you if you're not civil,' 
stormed the infuriated Binet. Polichinelle got up slowly and stretched himself. Dieu de Dieu, said he. If Pantaloon is to play Rodomont, I think I'll leave you. He is not amusing in the part. And he swaggered out before Monsieur Binet had recovered from his speechlessness. End of Book Two, Chapter Three. Scaramouche, a romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini, Book Two, Chapter Four. Exit, Monsieur Parvissimus. At four o'clock on Monday afternoon, the curtain rose on Figaro Scaramouche to an audience that filled three-quarters of the market hall. Monsieur Benet attributed this good attendance to the influx of people to Guichen for the fair, and to the magnificent parade of his company through the streets of the township at the busiest time of the day. André Louis attributed it entirely to the title. It was the Figaro touch that had fetched in the better-class bourgeoisie which filled more than half of the twenty-sou places and three-quarters of the twelve-sou seats. The lure had drawn them. Whether it was to continue to do so would depend upon the manner in which the canvas, over which he had laboured to the glory of Binet, was interpreted by the company. Of the merits of the canvas itself he had no doubt. The authors upon whom he had drawn for the elements of it were sound and he had taken of their best, which he claimed to be no more than the justice due to them. The company excelled itself. The audience followed with relish the sly intriguings of Scaramouche, delighted in the beauty and freshness of Clemen, was moved almost to tears by the hard fate which through four long acts kept her from the hungering arms of the so beautiful Leandre howled its delight over the ignominy of Pantaloon, the buffooneries of his sprightly lackey Harlequin, and the thrasonical strut and bellowing fierceness of the cowardly Rodomont. The success of the Benet troupe in Guichen was assured. That night the company drank Burgundy at Monsieur Benet's expense. The takings reached the sum of eight louis, which was as good business as Monsieur Benet had ever done in all his career. He was very pleased. Gratification rose like steam from his fat body. He even condescended so far as to attribute a share of the credit for the success to Monsieur Parvissimus. His suggestion, he was careful to say by way of properly delimiting that share, was most valuable, as I perceived at the time. "'And his cutting of quills,' growled Polichinelle. "'Don't forget that. It is most important to have by you a man who understands how to cut a quill, as I shall remember when I turn author.' But not even that jibe could stir M. Benet out of his lethargy of content. On Tuesday the success was repeated artistically and augmented financially. Ten louis and seven livres was the enormous sum that André Louis, the doorkeeper, counted over to M. Benet after the performance. Never yet had M. Benet made so much money in one evening and a miserable little village like Guichen was certainly the last place in which he would have expected this windfall. Ah, but Guichen in the time of fair, André Louis reminded him. There are people here from as far as Nantes and Rennes to buy and sell. Tomorrow, being the last day of the fair, the crowds will be greater than ever. We should better this evening's receipts. Better them? I shall be quite satisfied if we do as well, my friend. You can depend upon that, André Louis assured him. Are we to have Burgundy? And then, 
the tragedy occurred. It announced itself in a succession of bumps and thuds, culminating in a crash outside the door that brought them all to their feet in alarm. Perrault sprang to open and beheld the tumbled body of a man lying at the foot of the stairs. It emitted groans, therefore it was alive. Perrault went forward to turn it over and disclosed the fact that the body wore the wizened face of Scaramouche, a grimacing, groaning, twitching Scaramouche. The whole company, pressing after Perrault, abandoned itself to laughter. "'I always said you should change parts with me,' cried Harlequin. "'You're such an excellent tumbler. Have you been practicing? "'Fool!' Scaramouche snapped. "'Must you be laughing when I've all but broken my neck? "'You are right. We ought to be weeping, because you didn't break it. "'Come, man, get up.' And he held out a hand to the prostrate rogue. Scaramouche took the hand, clutched it, heaved himself from the ground, then with a scream dropped back again. "'My foot!' he complained. Benet rolled through the group of players, scattering them to right and left. Apprehension had been quick to seize him. Fate had played him such tricks before. "'What ails your foot?' quoth he sourly. "'It's broken, I think,' Scaramouche complained. "'Broken? Bah! Get up, man!' He caught him under the armpits and hauled him up. Scaramouche came howling to one foot. The other doubled under him when he attempted to set it down, and he must have collapsed again but that Benet supported him. He filled the place with his plaint, whilst Benet swore amazingly and variedly. "'Must you bellow like a calf, you fool? Be quiet! A chair here! Someone!' A chair was thrust forward. He crushed Scaramouche down into it. "'Let us look at this foot of yours.' Heedless of Scaramouche's howls of pain, he swept away shoe and stocking. "'What ails it?' he asked, staring. "'Nothing that I can see?' He seized it, heel in one hand, instep in the other, and gyrated it. Scaramouche screamed in agony until Climene caught Benet's arm and made him stop. "'My God! Have you no feelings?' she reproved her father. "'The lad has hurt his foot. Must you torture him? Will that cure it?' "'Hurt his foot!' said Benet. I can see nothing the matter with his foot, nothing to justify all this uproar. He has bruised it, maybe. A man with a bruised foot doesn't scream like that, said Madame, over Clement's shoulder. Perhaps he has dislocated it. That is what I fear, whimpered Scaramouche. Benet heaved himself up in disgust. Take him to bed, he bade them and fetch a doctor to see him. It was done, and the doctor came. Having seen the patient, he reported that nothing very serious had happened, but that in falling he had evidently sprained his foot a little. A few days' rest, and all would be well. "'A few days!' cried Benet. "'God of God! Do you mean that he can't walk?' "'It would be unwise.' indeed impossible for more than a few steps. M. Benet paid the doctor's fee, and sat down to think. He filled himself a glass of burgundy, tossed it off without a word, and sat thereafter staring into the empty glass. "'It is, of course, the sort of thing that must always be happening to me,' he grumbled to no one in particular. The members of the company were all standing in silence before him, sharing his dismay. I might have known that this, or something like it, would occur to spoil the first vein of luck that I have found in years. Ah, well, it is finished. Tomorrow we pack 
and depart. The best day of the fair on the crest of the wave of our success. A good fifteen louis to be taken, and this happens. God of God! Do you mean to abandon tomorrow's performance? All turn to stare with Benet at André Louis. Are we to play Figaro Scaramouche without Scaramouche? asked Binet, sneering. Of course not, André Louis came forward. But surely some rearrangements of the parts is possible. For instance, there is a fine actor in Polichinelle. Polichinelle swept him a bow. Overwhelmed, said he, ever sardonic. But he has a part of his own, objected Binet. A small part, which Pasquariel could play. And who will play Pasquariel? Nobody. We delete it. The play need not suffer. He thinks of everything, sneered Polichinelle. What a man! But Binet was far from agreement. Are you suggesting that Polichinelle should play Scaramouche? He asked incredulously. Why not? He is able enough. Overwhelmed again, interjected Polichinelle. Play Scaramouche with that figure? Binet heaved himself up to point a denunciatory finger at Polichinelle's sturdy, thick-set shortness. For lack of a better, said André Louis. Overwhelmed more than ever. Polichinelle's bow was superb at this time. Faith, I think I'll take the air to cool me after so much blushing. Go to the devil, Benet flung at him. Better and better, Polichinelle made for the door. On the threshold he halted and struck an attitude. Understand me, Benet. I do not now play Scaramouche in any circumstances whatever. And he went out. On the whole, it was a very dignified exit. André Louis shrugged, threw out his arms, and let them fall to his sides again. You have ruined everything, he told Monsieur Benet. The matter could easily have been arranged. Well, well, it is you are master here, and since you want us to pack and be off, that is what we will do, I suppose. He went out, too. Monsieur Benet stood in thought a moment, and then followed him, his little eyes very cunning. He caught him up in the doorway. Let us take a walk together, Monsieur Parvissimus, said he, very affably. He thrust his arm through André Louise and led him out into the street, where there was still considerable movement. Past the booths that ranged about the market they went, and down the hill towards the bridge. I don't think we shall pack tomorrow, said Monsieur Benet presently. In fact, we shall play tomorrow night. Not if I know Polichinelle. You have. I am not thinking of Polichinelle. Of whom, then? Of yourself. I am flattered, sir. And in what capacity are you thinking of me? There was something too sleek and oily in Benet's voice for André Louis' taste. I am thinking of you in the part of Scaramouche. Daydreams, said André Louis. You are amusing yourself, of course. Not in the least. I am quite serious. But I am not an actor. You told me that you could be? Oh, upon occasion. A small part, perhaps. Well, here is a big part. The chance to arrive at a single stride. How many men have had such a chance? It is a chance I do not covet, Monsieur Benet. Shall we change the subject? 
He was very frosty, as much perhaps because he scented in M. Binet's manner something that was vaguely menacing as for any other reason. "'We'll change the subject when I please,' said M. Binet, allowing a glimpse of steel to glimmer through the silk of him. "'Tomorrow night you play Scaramouche. You are ready enough in your wits, your figure is ideal, and you have just the kind of mordant humour for the part. You should be a great success.' "'It is much more likely that I should be an egregious failure.' "'That won't matter,' said Binet cynically, and explained himself. "'The failure will be personal to yourself. The receipts will be safe by then.' "'Much obliged,' said André Louis. "'We should take fifteen louis tomorrow night.' "'It is unfortunate that you are without a scaramouche,' said André Louis. "'It is fortunate that I have one.' Monsieur Pavissimus. André Louis disengaged his arm. I begin to find you tiresome, said he. I think I will return. A moment, Monsieur Pavissimus. If I am to lose that fifteen louis, you'll not take it amiss that I compensate myself in other ways. That is your own concern, Monsieur Benet. Pardon, Monsieur Parvissimus. It may possibly be also yours. Benet took his arm again. Do me the kindness to step across the street with me, just as far as the post office there. I have something to show you. André Louis went. Before they reached that sheet of paper nailed upon the door, he knew exactly what it would say. And in effect it was, as he had supposed, that twenty louis would be paid for information leading to the apprehension of one André Louis Moreau, lawyer of Gavriac, who was wanted by the King's lieutenant in Rennes upon a charge of sedition. M. Benet watched him whilst he read. Their arms were linked, and Benet's grip was firm and powerful. "'Now, my friend,' said he, "'will you be Monsieur Parvissimus and play Scaramouche tomorrow, or will you be André Louis Moreau of Gavriac and go to Rennes to satisfy the King's lieutenant?' "'And if it should happen that you are mistaken,' quoth André Louis, his face a mask, "'I'll take the risk of that.' leered M. Benet. "'You mentioned, I think, that you were a lawyer. An indiscretion, my dear. It is unlikely that two lawyers will be in hiding at the same time in the same district. You see, it is not really clever of me. Well, M. André Louis Moreau, lawyer of Gavriac, what is it to be?' We will talk it over as we walk back, said André Louis. What is there to talk over? One or two things, I think. I must know where I stand. Come, sir, if you please. Very well, said M. Binet, and they turned up the street again, but M. Binet maintained a firm hold of his young friend's arm, and kept himself on the alert for any tricks that the young gentleman might be disposed to play. It was an unnecessary precaution. André Louis was not the man to waste his energy futilely. He knew that in bodily strength he was no match at all for the heavy and powerful pantaloon. If I yield to your most eloquent and seductive persuasions, Monsieur Benet, said he sweetly, what guarantee do you give me that you will not sell me for twenty louis after I shall have served your turn. You have my word of honor for that, Monsieur Binet was emphatic. André Louis laughed. Oh, we are to talk of honor, are we? Really, Monsieur Binet? 
It is clear you think me a fool. In the dark he did not see the flush that leapt to Monsieur Benet's round face. And was some moments before he replied. Perhaps you are right, he growled. What guarantee do you want? I do not know what guarantee you can possibly give. I have said that I will keep faith with you. Until you find it more profitable to sell me. You have it in your power to make it more profitable always for me to keep faith with you. It is due to you that we have done so well in Guichen. Oh, I admit it frankly. In private, said André Louis. M. Benet left the sarcasm unheeded. What you have done for us here, with Figaro Scaramouche, you can do elsewhere with other things. Naturally, I shall not want to lose you. That is your guarantee. Yet tonight you would sell me for twenty louis. Because, name of God, you enraged me by refusing me a service well within your powers. Don't you think, had I been entirely the rogue you think me, that I could have sold you on Saturday last? I want you to understand me, my dear Parvissimus. I beg that you'll not apologize. You would be more tiresome than ever. Of course you will be jibing. You never miss a chance to jibe. It'll bring you trouble before you're done with life. Come. Here we are, back at the inn, and you have not yet given me your decision. André Louis looked at him. I must yield, of course. I can't help myself. Monsieur Benet released his arm at last and slapped him heartily upon the back. Well declared, my lad. You'll never regret it. If I know anything of the theatre, I know that you have made the great decision of your life. Tomorrow night you'll thank me. Andre Louis shrugged and stepped out ahead towards the inn, but Monsieur Benet called him back. Monsieur Pavissimus. He turned. There stood the man's great bulk, the moonlight beating down upon that round, fat face of his, and he was holding out his hand. Monsieur Pavissimus. No rancor. It is a thing I do not admit into my life. You will shake hands with me, and we will forget all this. André Louis considered him a moment with disgust. He was growing angry. Then, realized this, he conceived himself ridiculous. Almost as ridiculous as that sly, scoundrelly pantaloon. He laughed and took the outstretched hand. No rancor, Monsieur Benet insisted. Oh, no rancor, said André Louis. End of Book Two, Chapter Four Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini Book Two, Chapter Five Enter Scaramouche. Dressed in the close-fitting suit of a bygone age, all black, from flat velvet cap to rosetted shoes, his face whitened and a slight up-curled moustache glued to his upper lip. A small sword at his side and a guitar slung behind him. Scaramouche surveyed himself in a mirror and was disposed to be sardonic, which was the proper mood for the part. He reflected that his life, which until lately had been of a stagnant, contemplative quality, had suddenly become excessively active. In the course of one week he had been lawyer, mob orator, outlaw, property man, and finally buffoon. Last Wednesday he had been engaged in moving an audience of Rennes to anger. On this Wednesday he was to move an audience of Guichen to mirth. Then he had been concerned to draw tears. 
Today it was his business to provoke laughter. There was a difference, and yet there was a parallel. Then as now he had been a comedian, and the part that he had played then was, when you came to think of it, akin to the part he was to play this evening. For what had he been at Rennes but a sort of scaramouche, the little skirmisher, the astute intriguer, spattering the seed of trouble with a sly hand. The only difference lay in the fact that today he went forth under the name that properly described his type, whereas last week he had been disguised as a respectable young provincial attorney. He bowed to his reflection in the mirror. Buffoon, he apostrophized it. At last you have found yourself. At last you have come into your heritage. You should be a great success. Hearing his new name called out by M. Binet, he went below to find the company assembled, and waiting in the entrance corridor of the inn. He was, of course, an object of great interest to all the company. Most critically was he conned by M. Binet and Mademoiselle, by the former with gravely searching eyes, by the latter with a curl of scornful lip. "'You'll do,' M. Binet commended his make-up. "'At least you look the part.' "'Unfortunately men are not always what they look,' said Clemen acidly. "'That is a truth that does not at present apply to me,' said André Louis. "'For it is the first time in my life that I look what I am.' Mademoiselle curled her lip a little further, and turned her shoulder to him. But the others thought him very witty, probably because he was obscure. Columbine encouraged him with a friendly smile that displayed her large white teeth, and M. Benet swore yet once again that he would be a great success, since he threw himself with such spirit into the undertaking. Then, in a voice that for the moment he appeared to have borrowed from the roaring captain, M. Benet marshalled them for the short parade across to the market hall. The new Scaramouche fell into place beside Rodemont. The old one, hobbling on a crutch, had departed an hour ago to take the place of doorkeeper, vacated of necessity by André Louis, so that the exchange between those two was a complete one. Headed by Polichinelle banging his great drum, and Perrault blowing his trumpet, they set out and were duly passed in review by the ragamuffins drawn up in files to enjoy so much of the spectacle as was to be obtained for nothing. Ten minutes later the three knocks sounded, and the curtains were drawn aside to reveal a battered set that was partly garden, partly forest, in which Clemen feverishly looked for the coming of Leandre. In the wings stood the beautiful, melancholy lover, awaiting his cue, and immediately behind him the unfledged Scaramouche, who was anon to follow him. André Louis was assailed with nausea in that dread moment. He attempted to take a lightning mental review of the first act of this scenario of which he himself was the author-in-chief, but found his mind a complete blank. With perspiration starting from his skin, he stepped back to the wall, where above a dim lantern was pasted a sheet bearing the brief outline of the piece. He was still studying it when his arm was clutched and he was pulled violently towards the wings. He had a glimpse of Pantaloon's grotesque face, its eyes blazing, and he caught a raucous growl. Clemen has spoken your cue three times already! Before he realized it, he had been bundled on to the stage, and stood there, foolishly, blinking in the glare of the footlights, with their tin reflectors. So utterly foolish and bewildered did he look, that volley upon volley of laughter welcomed him from the audience, which this evening packed the hall from end to end. Trembling a little, his bewilderment at first increasing, he stood there, to receive that rolling tribute to his absurdity. 
Clemen was eyeing him with expectant mockery, savoring in advance his humiliation. Leandre regarded him in consternation, whilst behind the scenes Monsieur Benet was dancing in fury. "'Name of name!' he groaned to the rather scared members of the company assembled there. "'What will happen when they discover that he isn't acting?' But they never did discover it. Scaramouche's bewildered paralysis lasted but a few seconds. He realized that he was being laughed at, and remembered that his Scaramouche was a creature to be laughed with and not at. He must save the situation, twist it to his own advantage as best he could. And now his real bewilderment and terror was succeeded by acted bewilderment and terror far more marked, but not quite so funny. He contrived to make it clearly appear that his terror was of someone off the stage. He took cover behind a painted shrub, and thence, the laughter at last beginning to subside, he addressed himself to Climen and Leandre. Forgive me, beautiful lady, if the abrupt manner of my entrance startled you. The truth is that I have never been the same since that last affair of mine with Alma Viva. My heart is not what it used to be. Down there at the end of the lane I came face to face with an elderly gentleman carrying a heavy cudgel, and a horrible thought entered my mind that it might be your father, and that our little stratagem to get you safely married might already have been betrayed to him. I think it was the cudgel put such notion in my head. Not that I am afraid. I am not really afraid of anything. But I could not help reflecting that, if it should really have been your father, and he had broken my head with his cudgel, your hopes would have perished with me, for without me, what should you have done, my poor children? A ripple of laughter from the audience had been steadily enheartening him, and helping him to recover his natural impudence. It was clear they found him comical. They were to find him far more comical than ever he had intended, and this was largely due to the fortuitous circumstance upon which he had insufficiently reckoned. The fear of recognition by someone from Gavriac or Wren had been strong upon him. His face was sufficiently made up to baffle recognition, but there remained his voice. To dissemble this he had availed himself of the fact that Figaro was a Spaniard, and he had known a Spaniard at Louis le Grand, who spoke a fluent but most extraordinary French with grotesque excess of sibilant sounds. It was an accent that he had often imitated, as youths will imitate characteristics that excite their mirth. Opportunely he had bethought him of that Spanish student and it was upon his speech that to-night he modelled his own. The audience of Guichen found it as laughable on his lips as he and his fellows had found it formerly on the lips of that derided Spaniard. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Binet, listening to that glib impromptu of which the scenario gave no indication, had recovered from his fears. "'Dieu de Dieu!' he whispered, grinning. Did he do it then, on purpose? It seemed to him impossible that a man who had been so terror-stricken as he had fancied André Louis could have recovered his wits so quickly and completely. Yet the doubt remained. To resolve it after the curtain had fallen upon a first act that had gone with a verve unrivaled until this hour in the annals of the company borne almost entirely upon the slim shoulders of the new Scaramouche, M. Benet bluntly questioned him. They were standing in the space that did duty as green room. The company all assembled there, showering congratulations upon their new recruit. Scaramouche, a little exalted at the moment by his success, however trivial he might consider it to-morrow, took then a full revenge upon Clemen for the malicious satisfaction with which she had regarded his momentary blank terror. "'I do not wonder that you ask,' said he. "'Faith, I should have warned you that I intended to do my best from the start, 
to put the audience in a good humour with me. Mademoiselle very nearly ruined everything by refusing to reflect any of my terror. She was not even startled. Another time, mademoiselle, I shall give you full warning of my every intention. She crimsoned under her grease paint. But before she could find an answer of sufficient venom, her father was rating her soundly for her stupidity. The more soundly because himself he had been deceived by Scaramouche's supreme acting. Scaramouche's success in the first act was more than confirmed as the performance proceeded. Completely master of himself by now, and stimulated as only success can stimulate, he warmed to his work. Impudent, alert, sly, graceful, he incarnated the very ideal of Scaramouche, and he helped out his own native wit by many a remembered line from Beaumarchais thereby persuading the better informed among the audience that here indeed was something of the real Figaro, and bringing them, as it were, into touch with the great world of the capital. When at last the curtain fell for the last time, it was Scaramouche who shared with Clemen the honours of the evening. His name that was coupled with hers, and the calls that summoned them before the curtains. As they stepped back and the curtain screened them again from the departing audience, M. Benet approached them rubbing his fat hands softly together. This runagate young lawyer, whom chance had blown into his company, had evidently been sent by fate to make his fortune for him. The sudden success at Guichen, hitherto unrivaled, should be repeated and augmented elsewhere. There would be no more sleeping under hedges and tightening of belts. Adversity was behind him. He placed a hand upon Scaramouche's shoulder, and surveyed him with a smile whose oiliness not even his red paint and colossal false nose could dissemble. "'And what have you to say to me now?' he asked him. "'Was I wrong?' when I assured you that you would succeed? Do you think I have followed my fortunes in the theatre for a lifetime without knowing a born actor when I see one? You are my discovery, Scaramouche. I have discovered you to yourself. I have set your feet upon the road to fame and fortune. I await your thanks. Scaramouche laughed at him, and his laugh was not altogether pleasant. Always pantaloon, said he. The great countenance became overcast. I see that you do not yet forgive me the little stratagem by which I forced you to do justice to yourself. Ungrateful dog! as if I could have had any purpose but to make you, and I have done so. Continue as you have begun, and you will end in Paris. You may yet tread the stage of the Comédie Francaise, the rival of Talma, Fleury, and Dugazon. When that happens to you, perhaps you will feel the gratitude that is due to old Binet, for you will owe it all to this soft-hearted old fool. If you were as good an actor on the stage as you are in private, said Scaramouche, you would yourself have won to the Comédie Française long since. But I bear no rancor, Monsieur Benet. He laughed and put out his hand. Benet fell upon it and wrung it heartily. That, at least, is something, he declared. My boy, I have great plans for you, for us. Tomorrow we go to Moor. There is a fair there to the end of this week. Then on Monday we take our chances at Pipriac, and after that we must consider. It may be that I am about to realize the dream of my life. 
There must have been upwards of fifteen louis taken to-night. Where the devil is that rascal Cordemay? Cordemay was the name of the original Scaramouche, who had so unfortunately twisted his ankle. That Benet should refer to him by his secular designation was a sign that in the Benet company at least he had fallen for ever from the lofty eminence of Scaramouche. Let us go and find him, and then we'll away to the inn and crack a bottle of the best burgundy, perhaps two bottles. But Cordemay was not readily to be found. None of the company had seen him since the close of the performance. Monsieur Benet went round to the entrance. Cordemay was not there. At first he was annoyed. Then, as he continued in vain to bawl the fellow's name, he began to grow uneasy. Lastly, when Polichinelle, who was with them, discovered Cordemay's crutch standing discarded behind the door, M. Benet became alarmed. A dreadful suspicion entered his mind. He grew visibly pale under his paint. "'But this evening he couldn't walk without the crutch!' he exclaimed. "'How, then, does he come to leave it there and take himself off?' "'Perhaps he has gone on to the inn,' suggested someone. "'But he couldn't walk without his crutch!' Monsieur Benet insisted. Nevertheless, since clearly he was not anywhere about the market hall, to the inn they all trooped and deafened the landlady with their inquiries. Oh, yes, Monsieur Cordemay came in some time ago. Where is he now? He went away again at once. He just came for his bag. For his bag? Benet was on the point of apoplexy. How long ago was that? She glanced at the timepiece on the overmantel. It would be about half an hour ago. It was a few minutes before the Rennes diligence passed through. The Rennes diligence? Monsieur Benet was almost inarticulate. Could he... could he walk? He asked, on a note of terrible anxiety. Walk? He ran like a hare when he left the inn. I thought myself that his agility was suspicious, seeing how lame he had been since he fell downstairs yesterday. Is anything wrong? Monsieur Benet had collapsed into a chair. He took his head in his hands and groaned. The scoundrel was shamming all the time, exclaimed Clemene. His fall downstairs was a trick. He was playing for this. He has swindled us. Fifteen louis at least. Perhaps sixteen, said M. Benet. Oh, the heartless blackguard! To swindle me, who have been as a father to him, and to swindle me in such a moment! from the ranks of the silent, awe-stricken company, each member of which was wondering by how much of the loss his own meagre pay would be mulcted, there came a splutter of laughter. M. Benet glared with blood-injected eyes. "'Who laughs?' he roared. "'What heartless wretch has the audacity to laugh at my misfortune?' André Louis, still in the sable glories of Scaramouche, stood forward. He was laughing still. It is you, is it? You may laugh on another note, my friend, if I choose a way to recoup myself that I know of. Dullard! Scaramouche scorned him. Rabbit-brained elephant! What if Cordemay has gone with fifteen louis? Hasn't he left you with something worth twenty times as much? M. Benet gaped, uncomprehending. You are between two wines, I think. You've been drinking, he concluded. So I have, at the Fountain of Thalia. 
Oh, don't you see? Don't you see the treasure that Cordemay has left behind him? What has he left? A unique idea for the groundwork of a scenario. It unfolds itself all before me. I'll borrow part of the title from Moliere. We'll call it Les Forberies de Scaramouche. And if we don't leave the audience of Moore and Pipriac with sides aching from laughter, I'll play the dullard pantaloon in the future. Polichinelle smacked fist into palm. Superb, he said fiercely. To call fortune from misfortune, to turn loss into profit, that is to have genius. Scaramouche made a leg. Polichinelle... You are a fellow after my own heart. I love a man who can discern my merit. If Pantaloon had half your wit, we should have Burgundy tonight in spite of the flight of Cordemay. Burgundy! roared Monsieur Benet, and before he could get farther, Harlequin had clapped his hands together. That is the spirit, Monsieur Benet. You heard him, landlady. He called for Burgundy. I called for nothing of the kind. But you heard him, dear madam. We all heard him. The others made chorus, whilst Scaramouche smiled at him and patted his shoulder. Up, man. A little courage. Did you not say that fortune awaits us? And have we not now the wherewithal to constrain fortune? Burgundy, then, to... to toast... Les Fauberies de Scaramouche. And M. Benet, who was not blind to the force of the idea, yielded, took courage, and got drunk with the rest. End of Book Two, Chapter Five.